there's great benevolence in who Jesus is. I'm going to move along, but he says all authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. Notice when you read the scriptures, Jesus is no ordinary man. Jesus is the only person who can say in the scriptures, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. When you think about Jesus, you got to think about he's the word incarnate, that the word became flesh, the logos, the word of God became flesh, that God put on a human body. God, who had heavenly authority, had to come back to the earth to retake and reclaim the earthly authority that Adam had lost for humankind. Remember this, Jesus didn't take back authority for God. He took back authority for us. God always has, has authority. Jesus always had authority, always had power, but he took it back for us. He took back authority for us. The second point I want to hit upon is when you deal with a king and understanding who Jesus is, is that a king is able to extend the influence and the impact of his kingdom by investing authority and power on his authorized representatives. He invests authority and power on his authorized representatives, those he has authorized to represent him. In the scriptures, God showed me this pattern numerous times throughout the scriptures that God extends his kingdom through us. The kingdom of God extends through us. I've mentioned this probably a few months ago, but it's all about when you read the gospels, the kingdom of God. That was the principal theme I saw again and again and again, the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God, the perfect, Fulfillment of the will of God through the manifestation and the reliance on the power of God is fulfilling the will of God by relying on the power of God. And what he has done is he extends his impact, his influence, his kingdom on the earth through his representatives. That's why he gives this command, go ye therefore and teach all nations. Go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The representatives Jesus was making, he was making disciples. That's, that's the role. We are all called to be disciples. I'm glad when somebody joined Mount Zion, the church, but better than being a church member is to be a disciple. Every church member is supposed to first be a disciple. And a sign of your discipleship is coming to church. And the goal of Jesus Christ was to make disciples. To make, he, he was making disciples. Everywhere he went, he was making disciples. He, he was making disciples everywhere. And a disciple is a kingdom ambassador. Today, when you think about a disciple, start thinking about a kingdom ambassador. He took me to this in the scriptures over in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 20 says, for we are God's ambassadors. We are his ambassadors. And Paul, at the height of his theology in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 20, Paul says he calls himself an ambassador for God in chains. That even while he's locked up, he sees himself as I'm God's ambassador in chains. And in that we call to be kingdom ambassadors and the ambassador is an authorized representative, is an emissary, one who goes and speaks on behalf of the king, who's charged with power while the king is away, who can represent the king. And the ambassador has the same authority in that land as the one who placed them and sent them on that journey. And we got to see ourselves as we came to ambassadors and we supposed to have the same power, the same authority that Jesus Christ had as his disciples. We called to be just like him. And the example he gave me is when you're growing up. He, he made it plain to him when you're growing up. I remember when I was growing up as a teenager and when your parents leave the home, 
and they go out to the house and they tell you, we're leaving the house, you in charge, look after your brother. Go ahead and look after your younger sibling and make sure they're okay. Now the parent is the one who's charged with watching the child. The parent is the one who made the child. The parent is the one who has the authority over the child. The parent is the one who has the power over the child. But because the parent is going away, they give the authority to the other sibling to watch out for the child. The older child has no authority in and of themselves, but they are given authority by the parent. And while the parent is gone, they are able to operate in the same authority while the parent isn't there at that moment. And as long as the parent is away, they can exercise that authority. And the same thing applies to us when we deal with our relationship with God. That Jesus came down here and he put on some human flesh and he did his mission. And his thing was he let them know I'm going to go to prepare a place for you. And when I go away and go to where I'm going to, I'm going to give you my authority. I'm going to give you my power. I'm going to give you the same ability that was given to me. I'm going to give it to you and he's giving it to the body of believers. The same power that operated in the life of Jesus Christ is called to operate in our own life. The same power that can raise the dead. The same power that can heal the sick. The same power that can open deaf ears. The same power that can open blind eyes. The same power that can call Lazarus out the grave. The same power that can walk on water. The same power that can survive being beat on a cross. The same power that can take persecution. The same power that can take being hated. The same power that can endure everything. That same power is in the life of the believer. You got to tell yourself, I've got the same power. I've got the same authority. I've got the same abilities. In Jesus' name, you've got the same power. You got to see that God has given it unto us, the body of believers, the same authority, the same power, the same abilities. You might say, preacher, how you know I got the same power? Because he says it in the scriptures. Go home and read John. I believe over in chapter 14, 13. He says, whatsoever you ask in my name, I shall do it. It's not until he's leaving, he starts saying, you start asking in my name. Start using my authority. Start using my power. Even over in Mark, it says, he says, my name, my name. He talks about how you will cast out demons. You will speak in new tongues. He talks about how the servants... The servant will even not be able to hurt you. Poison won't be, even be able to kill you. Everything going to have to submit to you in the name of Jesus. I'm going to tell you something you don't want to hear today. You no match for the devil fighting yourself. You, you, you no match. You no match fighting Satan yourself. I try to work out five, six days a week, and I know I can use all my physical strength, and I don't have a chance to beat the devil. I can use all the power I think I got. I can use all the intellect that I've accumulated over years, all the knowledge, all the learning, and I'm no match for the devil. And you no match for the devil either. You can't fight him yourself. What you got to do is you got to call for backup and bring in some help when you call in the name of Jesus. He's not afraid when we fight ourselves. He's afraid when you call on Jesus' name. And say, in the name of Jesus Christ, then you can overcome the enemy. You can defeat Satan with the name of Jesus. You got power when you call on the name of Jesus. That's when you got authorities when you call on that name. And it's not magic calling on the name of Jesus. What you're doing is acknowledging you have a relationship with Jesus. Your power is in your relationship with Jesus Christ. You call the name because you have the relationship. If I call your name and I don't know you, you just gonna look at me like I'm crazy. Like, wh who's that calling me? I don't know who's calling me. But if I know you and I call your name and call for you, you gonna come because we had a relationship. 
And you got to see the same principle with Jesus. God will help those who don't know him. He'll help anybody. But those he got a relationship with, they going to unlock and unleash more of his power. They going to access more of his presence. And they going to get what they need even quicker sometimes because they got the relationship. People today spend a lot of time fighting over, what's Jesus' name? Oh, you got to call him Jesus. You got to call him Yahusha. You got to call Yah. You got to call Yahweh. You better just call him Jesus. You better just call him by some name. You got to call him. People debate his name. The truth is people using Hebrew names. You can't even pronounce names in Hebrew. Hebrew only have vowels in it. We add vowels, try to pronounce things. You can't even say Y-H-W-H, God's name. We got to add in the A and the E. We say Yahweh when the truth is you can't even pronounce it. And we waste time fighting the trivial stuff over what name am I going to use? Trivial. Satan is laughing when we fight over the name because we're not calling on Jesus. We waste time fighting over what day of the week to worship. Oh, I worship on Friday. I worship on Saturday. I worship on Sunday. I don't got time to waste time on foolishness. Because my Bible says Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. And so I got to worship him on whatever day. The truth is you're supposed to worship God every day of the week. No day should be more important than another. Your lifestyle should be an act of worship to where you worshiping God every day. Monday ain't different from Sunday. You act the same every day. You worship him every day. You call his name every day. You sing praises every day. You pray every day. Every day should be the same with God. But we don't act like that in church. We, well, I'm going to act right on Saturday. I'm going to act right on Sunday. I'm going to act right this day. That's not worship. Worship makes it a lifestyle. And you got to start seeing yourself. I'm his authorized representative. you his representative. You got to see yourself wearing a name tag. You know, if you have name tags, say, hello, my name is. Yours is going to say, hello, my name is a Christian, a representative of God. So before you want to curse somebody out, you got to look at your name tag. Oh, I'm a Christian. I can't act like that. Before you go to a certain place, oh, I'm a Christian. I can't be over there. Oh, I'm a Christian. I can't talk about people. Sometimes Christians, we talk about people like a dog and gossip about them. But you're a believer. You can't slander somebody's name. Because if you're a Christian, you know whatever I sow, I shall reap. Whatever I do to you, is going to come back in my own life. Either I'm going to get it or generations to come are going to get it, but somebody down my line is going to receive it. That's why you got to spend your time sowing positive seeds. The way we call to represent God, he has divine attributes. God is omniscient. He's all-knowing. God is omnipotent. God is all-powerful. God is omnipresent. He's everywhere at the same time. Those are his divine attributes. The fourth one is an attribute we supposed to have. Because the Bible says we made in his image and his likeness. God is omnibenevolent, all good. That is the attribute we were designed to have. We were never meant to be all-knowing. That's why Adam was supposed to be able to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We were never meant to be everywhere at the same time because he created us with a physical body. And even in heaven, we're going to get a celestial body. We were never meant to have, be all-powerful. That's an attribute for God all of himself. Our power and dominion was supposed to be over the earth. But we were created to be omnibenevolent. Sin was never created to have any place in our lives. Satan introduced something that didn't exist in the heavenly realm when sin and Adam introduced something on the earthly realm, sin, that never existed before. And sin, as I tell them all the time in church, is hamartia, H-A-M-A-R-T-I-A, a violation of divine law, trans violation, transgression of divine law. And so we called to be his authorized representative. And you might be saying, how, how, how am I supposed to act like God, preach? How am I supposed to do this? It's not human effort. It's not trying humanly. It's not done that way. You got to do it the same way Jesus did it, through the power of the Holy Spirit. 
is by obedience. You want power with God, become more obedient to the will of God. Less doing what you want to do, more doing what God wants you to do. It's obedience. Jesus demonstrated his sonship through obedience. And the goal is to be obedient. And so the more I'm obedient to the will of God, the more I yield to the power of the Holy Spirit, the more than God will endow us with power and authority to be able to represent him on the earth. Remember this in the scriptures. Everything Jesus did, he did through the power of the Holy Spirit. His ministry doesn't even start until he deals with the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why he tells his mother when she says, turn can you can we provide some wine? He said, woman, what have I to do with you? M Mother, what have I got to do with you? Next? It's not my time yet. But he still demonstrated his power over substances, over the physical elements and the substances by taking water and turning it into wine. He does the same thing when he walks on water. He demonstrates I have power over the physical elements that man worships and that we think give life, that he truly is the life giver. And we are called to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit and to represent God. Walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. It's the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one that God has given us. And it makes sense now when you read Romans 8, 11. He says, but if, but if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he will give life to your mortal body. He will give life to our mortal body. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. And you got to start thinking about the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. The spirit of the living God, the Holy Spirit, is the same spirit that lives in me. That means I got resurrection power living in the inside of me. Even when I don't realize it, I got resurrection power, which means whatever is decaying and dying can be brought back to life because I got resurrection power. Your cells can be decaying and dying from chemotherapy. But you got to tell yourself the Holy Spirit lives in me so my cells are being regenerated and brought back to life. Your liver could be dying on the inside, but you got to say I got the power of the Holy Spirit living in me so my liver's being brought back to life. Your heart may not be operating right, but you got to tell yourself, I got the living power of the Holy Spirit, resurrection power, to where the blood's going to pump just right, and I'm going to be able to keep living. You got to see you got resurrection power on the inside, that even when you're in depression and sadness, you can't stay down but so long because there's a bright side coming because you got resurrection power on the inside. Even when you're depressed and you're distressed right now, you got resurrection power on the inside. If you're afraid right now, you still got resurrection power on the inside because he's a great God church and God is all power in his hands. He's a mighty good God and he's got all authority in his hands. He's a great God from Zion so he's got the authority in his hands. He's a great God church and he's got all power and authority has been given unto him. Even when he went down to the grave, he might have went down, but he got up with all power in his hands. It don't matter what the story looks like. What it matters is what the end is going to be. It doesn't matter how bleak it looks right now. You got to know it's going to turn out all right because I rely on God, and it's going to be all right in the end if I rely on his power and his authority. You got resurrection power. And when the Holy Spirit gets involved, what once is dead is going to come back to life. You might be home right now, dreading that you're trapped with your spouse. It don't matter if you argue all the time. It don't matter if you're fighting. You got to yield to the Holy Spirit. Take time, pray together. If the other one too mad, pray what you're going to pray by yourself. And you pray this prayer, Lord, let your Holy Spirit Breathe life back into my marriage. Lord, breathe life back into my relationship. You can have a bad relationship with your children. They feel you abandoned them. Lord, breathe life 
back into my relationship with my children to where we can foster and develop a new relationship in you. Lord, breathe life. Breathe life. You're struggling right now financially. Lord, I serve you. Lord, I'm a tither. Lord, I do what you tell me. Breathe life back into my finances and provide what I need economically so that I'll be all right. Your body, you feel, is withering and you dying before your time. Lord, breathe life back into my body and extend my year so that I get every year you've allotted unto me. Because God is such a good God, he promises I'll give you back the years that the locust has eaten. Every year the canker worm is taken from you, God will give it back to you. Believe that he can breathe life into it and seal it in Jesus' name. In the name of King Jesus, in the name of the only person who led a life that's 100% obedient and devoted to you, in the name of Jesus Christ, breathe life. Breathe life in Jesus' name. And God made your promise, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, that same spirit, the same spirit that dwells inside of you, that same spirit, will give life to our mortal body. And when you deal with the body, you're not just dealing with sarcasm in Greek, you're dealing with the whole thing, the mind, the being, the soul, all the dimensions of who you are. We're close with you got great access to God through the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who makes us God's authorized representative. Without the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm the devil's representative. I'm going to talk bad about people. I'm going to do people and I'm going to look out for myself. I'm going to treat people poorly. I'm going to be negative. I'm going to be condescending. I'm going to be hurtful. Without the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to represent Satan down here. But with the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to represent God. I'm going to be good. I'm going to be merciful. I'm going to be kind. I'm going to be patient. I'm going to be gentle. I'm going to be forgiving. I'm going to give people another opportunity. I'm going to see the potentialities that lie within other people. I'm going to be selfless with the power of the Holy Spirit. With the power of the Holy Spirit, you're going to be able to cast out demons and rebuke the spirit of fear. You're going to be able to rebuke foreign spirits of witchcraft. You're going to be able to rebuke, rebuke demons that are seeking to attack those around you through the power of the Holy Spirit. You can rebuke curses that people have placed on people through the power of the Holy Spirit. And you can seal yourself into the protective covering of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to close with the final point. We've hit upon the third point for today is that the reign, the reign of a king lasts for as long as the lifespan of the king. The reign of the king lasts for as long as the lifespan of the king. I always say in America, we're used to presidents. We're used to senators. We're used to Congress people, congressmen, congresswomen. We're used to mayors and city council people. We are used to people who we have authority over. We vote you in, we vote you out. The president's got a four-year term, and I'm hoping God have mercy. He's voted out after this year, but he's got a four-year term. Senators get a six-year term. People in Congress get two-year terms. Mayors, four-year terms. Governors, four-year terms. And if you don't like what they do, you vote them out. And so they serve at the will of the people. They serve based on the power of special interest and people who can support them. We'll make it clear for the church today, even in churches today, the past a lot of time is voted in by the selection committee and voted on out, right on out the door by the selection committee. They'll vote you in. They vote you on out. I say it if people don't like it. Amen. Amen. You, they'll vote you in. So you better preach a sermon. They better like it. You better pray in a way they like. You better do what they want you to do is the human thought. 
you thinking, I'm serving people. When the truth is, the pastor will be serving God, not people. Don't matter what people think. Don't matter if they like you or not. You better make sure God likes you. He always loves you. But you make sure he likes the stuff you're doing, that you're pleasing him. And we're so used to serving people that we focus on what we want we think is important. We're so used to public officials. They serve what I want. It's what I want. My will. My way. My, my will. When the truth is God as king, he doesn't operate that way. God does not serve at the will of the people. God does not serve at the pleasure of the people. And I'm going to say something that's going to hurt some people this morning, but it's true. God doesn't care what I think or what you think. He, he don't care. Well, God, I want to do that. God don't care. We got to say, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. No, God said it, that settles it. Don't matter what you believe, don't matter what you want, doesn't matter what you like. God serves for his own purpose, for his own pleasure, and for his own will. And since he's a king, he answers to nobody. A king answers to nobody. A king never has an election, and a king serves for his own purpose. And the king's term is for his life. When you read the Bible, every king died out except one. David was a good king, but he only could live 40 years as king. Solomon was a good king. Rehoboam was a good king. They were good kings, but they only get but so long. You can be a good person, but you only get but so long. Jesus Christ reigns for the length of his lifespan, and it looked like he only had 33 years, but the good news is that even though it seemed like he had lost the battle, he went around preaching and teaching and healing those afflicted by the devil. He went around raising the dead, getting Lazarus back up. He went around healing people who just touched his garment, offering living water to everybody. He went around being a blessing to everybody, and for that, they wanted his life. All the good that he did, they conspired against him, and he was sold out for 30 pieces of silver. And Jesus Christ, who seemed like he was preaching and preaching and preaching and couldn't be stopped, was arrested by some soldiers, tried before Pilate, and was laid out to die and hung on the cross. Jesus, who never said a bad word about nobody, was whipped with 40 lashes minus one. Jesus was made to lay on the cross while they put some nails in his feet and put some nails in his hand. Jesus was made to endure a crown that had thorns on his side and was pressed down on his head so he could start bleeding. Jesus, who never hurt nobody, had the sign King of the Jews placed over his head. Jesus, who all he did was help people, had to watch the soldiers cast lots for his clothing. Jesus, who was there for so many, was left by his disciples and was laid out on the cross, stretched out to die. Jesus, who opened the doors of the church so many times, had to do it one more time for the thief on the cross. Jesus, who was a blessing to everybody, had to become a curse so that we could be saved. Jesus, who had suffered and suffered and suffered and asked for some water to drink, was given some hyssop and some vinegar so he could suffer. Jesus, who could save so many, was laughed at and couldn't save himself. And it looked like he had lost. It looked like all he had said was wrong. It looked like he died of failure because they took his body down and they placed it in the ground. And it looked like all hope was lost and that Satan had won the victory. And it looked darkest when the demons were having a party down in hell. But the good news is, even though he, it seemed like he would sleep Friday, and it seemed like he would sleep all day Saturday, the good news is on Sunday morning, he got up and he rose with all power. And I'm so glad that he got up this morning. I'm so glad that he rose from the dead. I'm so glad he got up with all power in his hands. I'm so glad that he got up because that means we can rise too. And I'm so glad I serve a risen God. He's a great God, church. 
And I'm glad he got up with all power in his hands. And because he got up, he got the victory. Death has no sting. Hell has no hold. Hades can't hold you down. Because he got up, you can rise again. Because he lives, you can face tomorrow. Because he lives, I know I can live again. Because he rose, I know I'm going to rise with him. Because he arose and he got up from the dead. And now he can reign forever with no limits on his term. The old hymn is right. King Jesus reigned and reigned forever. Forever and ever and ever he reigned. God reigns and he reigns forever. I serve a risen king. I serve a risen savior whose term will never expire and he has all power and authority in his hands. Palm Sunday they say it but they don't say it at the right time. I'm going to say it now. Right on King Jesus. Right on King Jesus. Right on King Jesus the conquering king. Jesus is the king who conquered death, hell, and the grave. He's conquered everything. That's why death cannot hold you. You're going to die but one time. And the truth is, death ain't all that bad. When it's your time, you're going to disappear. You're going to lay this body down. The spirit's going to rise from inside of you and go on back to your heavenly father. All that's going to happen is you're going to go home. You're not going to suffer. It's not going to be difficult. It's not going to be hard. You're not even going to think about it. The moment you die, your spirit is carried off to God, and you go home, and you have a homecoming to where you see all the saints who came before. That's when you get to meet Abraham and Moses. That's when you get to meet Jacob. You get to meet Isaac. That's when you get to be able to see Isaiah and Ezekiel. That's when you see Hosea and Daniel. That's when you see Jeremiah and Jonah. That's when you see Malachi. That's when you're able to see Habakkuk. That's when you're able to see old man Hezekiah. That's when you're able to see Ruth and Esther. That's when you're able to see Phoebe and Lydia. That's when you're able to see Paul and Peter and James and John. That's when you're able to see all the great saints that came on before. And it's going to be good to see them because you're going to tell them I read about you, but now I see you. And I'm able to see your story. And it's good that you're going to be able to see them, but you're going to say, slide out the way and let me see King Jesus. Let me see the one I've longed to see all the days of my life. Let me see the one I've been praying to all these years. And you're going to see him face to face. That's when it's a good time when you get to heaven and you see Jesus. You're going to see your old relatives, but when you see your big brother, the elder brother, Jesus Christ, the king of all kings, that's when you're going to know you made it home. My Bible says Jesus is going to reign over all until the end of time. He's going to reign over all to the end of time. And then he hands the kingdom over to the Father so that God may be all in all. He hands it over to the Father so God may be all in all. This day, take the opportunity and acknowledge and recognize the kingship of Jesus in your life. Think about what areas of my life am I ruling over that I need to give to King Jesus? What areas am I still trying to dominate that I need to give to Jesus to be king and Lord over that area? It's Resurrection Sunday. Take some time and focus on that anything I need, God has it, all authority. All authority in heaven and on the earth has been given unto him. This Sunday, all I hit upon was the earthly authority given to him. But he has such high heavenly authority. He is my intercessor. He's my mediator. He bridges the gap between humankind and God. The God-man, Jesus Christ, is the king and king of all kings and lord of all lords. Lord, we ask right now for you to assert yourself on the throne in every life right now. Use this opportunity of social distancing. Use this opportunity of being 
stuck in the home, use this opportunity of isolation to commune with your people and to have your divine presence. Communicate with each and every person to cultivate an individual and a communal relationship with each family right now. I pray, Father God, that there are more prayers rendered during this time period than before. I pray there are more lives given over to you than before. If somebody doesn't know you and the beauty of relationship with you, I ask right now, Father God, let them say these words. I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. And I believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And he now sits on the right hand of the Father. And I believe that Jesus Christ loves me and I love him. And I want to cultivate a love relationship with God. Lord, help people to fall in love with you right now in ways they never have before. And I pray you restore joy back to relationship for those who are just tired right now. Give back joy relationship with you. Rekindle right now in the joy of salvation and salvific experiences right now. Give back that joy right now. Give back a hunger and a thirst for you right now. Sometimes the world can douse our fire. So we get satisfied just watching TV, just listening to music, and just getting hurried by the busyness of life. I pray right now that you draw back into relationship with you and that you, Father God, you fill voids and create a hunger for yourself. I pray for the endowment of your Holy Spirit and let your spirit move right now, right through telephones and through computer screens right now. Let your Holy Spirit move right now. Touch right now in Jesus' name. Move your, by your divine presence right now. Let your spirit just flow right now to where you move in new dimensions right now. And I rebuke Satan and his empire right now. I rebuke the enemy right now. And I pray for your healing spirit right now. Just flow, Holy Spirit. Flow right now. Flow. The spirit of the living God. Show yourself strong. Show your divine power. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, show yourself. Anoint right now. Let your anointing flow. Call out prophets right now. Call out priests right now. Call out preachers right now. Call them out right now. Evangelists right now. Call out those you have to be leaders right now. Call out deacons right now. Call out ministers right now. Call out trustees right now. Call out missionaries right now. Call out your people right now. Call them out of in Jesus' name. Call them out right now. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, come forth right now. And I pray for experiences with the risen Christ. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, let it be done. You be glorified. And prune off, prune off the human edges right now. Let the spiritual man rise up and let the human man be put down right now. Let the flesh be subjugated and let the spirit arise. Cover every home right now. Cover every, cover, cover every home right now. By your Holy Spirit, cover right now. Protect. Keep healthy right now. I rebuke suicidal thoughts in Jesus' name and proclaim your life, your liberty, and your hope. Give joy in Jesus' name, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to have the benediction in a moment. On this week, because it's the ending of Holy Week, take time and read the resurrection accounts of Jesus Christ in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's the consistency that you get in the three synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And in the uniqueness of John, you are able to see the resurrection narrative. That's so important to the Christian belief, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus is not just a good man. Jesus is not just a moral teacher. Jesus is not just a prophet. Jesus is not just a priest. Jesus is not just an evangelist. Jesus is not just a healer. Jesus is God, and he has risen from the dead. And I'm going to wish you a blessed Resurrection Sunday. Be blessed. Know that you're on my heart, and I carry each and every one of you on my heart. 
God bless you. I want to thank Deacon Day as well. He takes the time, come out all the time for every time we do a broadcast. Let's look to the Lord to be dismissed. And now unto him who is fully able to keep us from falling and present us faultless before his glorious presence with exceeding joy to the only wise, immutable, true God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, both dominion and power, now and forever. And all God's people say it, amen. Amen. God bless you. Be blessed this Sunday morning. God bless you.